Number 10, the Kennedys. For the older folks at home, this is going to be no surprise. But for the younger audience, such as myself, let me explain. The Kennedys were a wealthy and powerful family in the US. A lot of their scandals originating from organized crime, American politics, and some juicy rumors. The most famous Kennedy being JFK. My generation knows him from Call of Duty Black Ops 1. Remember 5? It was, good, it was a good zombies map. The older generation remembers him for that one Sunday car trip in Dallas. You know what I'm talking about. He may have also been shacking up with Marilyn Monroe. His father was a bootlegger during the Prohibition era and his family seems to have a lot of plane crashes for some reason. I'm not sure why. The Kennedys are textbook scandalous and will be talked about for a long time to come. Number 9, The Jacksons. As much as I love fame and fortune and baby, Chetty's all about that. I wanted to be famous ever since I was a tubby kid and I'm slowly getting there too. Nice. I don't think I'll ever reach the same level as Michael Jackson. Seriously, I wouldn't be surprised if the first aliens that we meet know the moonwalk. Not because they're from outer space, but because the reach of Michael Jackson knows no bounds. Starting with the Jackson 5 in the 70s and rising to stardom and becoming the biggest star of the 80s and 90s, in the 2000s too, growing up he was pretty popular. Multiple allegations of misconduct don't look good on anyone, even for the king of pop though. He's, he, he's got a few things stacked against him. Number 8, the Trumps. The billionaire extraordinaire turned POTUS is not shy from scandal. And I'm not talking about during his presidency either. I ain't gonna touch that. Some younger folks may not remember Donald Trump from the 80s and 90s, where he was arguably more famous. After getting a small loan of a million dollars, built his real estate empire and perhaps broke a few laws and or using legal loopholes to get what he wanted. I mean, could you really trust the guy that slashed his name on everything? Trump Hotel, Trump Airlines, Trump Board Game. And that's just him, I guess. Number seven, the Rockefeller. Donald Trump might have been a billionaire or the most famous billionaire, but I still think J.D. Rockefeller takes the cake and his family, actually. A little history lesson here. Rockefeller, in a nutshell, was the first modern billionaire. Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark levels of wealth. Seriously, he was pretty rich. When oil and gas became big business in the late 1880s because industrial revolution, cars, we need oil, his company, Standard Oil, slowly rose up until they had a monopoly on the oil industry. By cutting out middlemen and cornering the market, he amassed billions. Today, adjusted for inflation, his pockets were lined with a very healthy $23 billion. Say it again, $23 billion. And that was all the way back then. Way before Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and Buffett did it. I wouldn't mind $23 billion myself. Sounds good, right? Oh, all the McDonald's I could have. Oh, yeah. Number six, the Coppolas. Imagine being a not so well known director, then Marlon Brando walks in the room and goes, Let's make a movie. The Godfather, great movie, right? Well, it seems that filmmaking runs in the family. Awesome. A whole family of people involved in film. You gotta love that. I love film, that's awesome. However, for those fans of The Godfather, which if you haven't seen it, please do, it's, it's a masterpiece, go see it. What's not a masterpiece, however, is The Godfather 3. You can skip that one. I can just imagine the look on people's faces when they thought they were going to see a trilogy completed masterfully. It's a real stinker, folks, for many reasons, but a big one is Sofia Coppola, who plays Michael Corleone's daughter in the movie, which in real life is Francis Ford Coppola's daughter, the director of the movie. Imagine taking one of the best movie licenses of all time and almost single-handedly ruining that. Sorry, Dad. Number five, the Kardashians. Everybody knows the Kardashians. Everybody and everyone knows that they've had tons of scandals. Kim Kardashian being married to Kanye West is just scandal by proxy. Come on, come on that guy's crazy. She also had a tape that got out. Not, not her best moment. Mr. Kardashian was a lawyer on the O.J. Simpson case where he may or may not have done it. And of course, Kris Jenner married Bruce Jenner and who's now the fabulous Caitlyn Jenner and her daughter was in a weird Pepsi commercial this one time and this whole list could be about them, honestly. Strangely enough, for people who generally don't have talent in Hollywood, they sure get a lot of press. 
which at some point is annoying, I'm sure. But be nice, paparazzi, or no Christmas presents. I know Santa Claus, and I'm, I'm, I'm keeping a list. It's early, but I'm keeping a list this year. Number four, the queen. Being the queen of England is hard, or so I'm told. I mean, it must be kind of nice to sit in a big palace all day, eating cucumber sandwiches, and getting lost in such a big place. I, I know I would, I, I would get lost for sure. The royal family, however, are no saints and have their fair share of scandals. Prince Andrew has gotten himself into some trouble in recent tabloids, but for some who don't know, Prince Harry was quite the wild child 20 years ago. A prince on the loose, if you will. Not to mention the whole debacle with Princess Diana. The car accident is a little sus, not gonna lie. Even way back in the day when both world wars were on, there was some minor cover up to hide the family's German heritage. Kinda hard to fight the Germans when your queens are one of the Germans, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. As long as there's a crown, there's always gonna be scandal. Number three, Wally World. That's what my family calls Walmart. I don't know, that's just what we call it. The Walmart family is quite wealthy and tied to the Walmart Corporation, of course. And if you didn't know, Walmart doesn't have a squeaky clean track record. You mean a multi-billion dollar department store located in over 20 countries around the world hasn't been to every rule of law applied to them? <laughs> I'm shooketh. Not to diss Walmart, I love you guys. You got some good deals there, but there's no way anyone at home hasn't heard horror stories about working there. Come on, I know you're like, yeah, you're thinking about it right now, I know you are. On a more heinous note, Walmart's production methods are uncouth, as they use a version of labor I'm not allowed to say on YouTube. But in short, but in short their clothes are cheaply made and then sold at a huge markup. But because the production was so cheap, you can walk in there and buy a shirt for $15 and you feel like you saved, you feel good. Oh, there's a McDonald's, I'm gonna go there later. Nice, it's great, I love capitalism, it's the best. Number two, the Genovese. Probably the most infamous crime family to ever exist, or ask for protection money. One of the five families of New York, the Genovese family were wise guys, good fellas, tough guys, made men, part of the crew, and like Don Rickles said once, probably sat around all day and smelling their guns. I love Don Rickles. It would be difficult to quantify everything the crime family had going for them. What separates the Italian mafia from everyday hoodlums is that they are organized, hence the name organized crime. Profiteering off anything they could really. Illicit substances, rackets, scams, gambling, and connections everywhere really. Watch The Irishman, it's on Netflix, it's a good movie. You'll know what I mean. Hey Frank, what do you want to do later Frank? Number one, The Clintons. Hillary, don't come in the room. Probably the grooviest president ever to hold office. Bill Clinton was president around the time I was born, so I'm not that familiar with his politics and policies. And when I think of the late 90s, I think of Nintendo 64, Tony Hawk, and MTV. So it would be difficult for me to talk about that in any way, really. Is the Clinton family a bunch of wealthy American leaders who have some ill-gotten gains and emailed the leaders? Yes, most likely, but you all know why this is number one, don't you? Did you really think that me, Big Ched, Chetty, was going to talk about Clinton and not talk about his impeachment? Being one of only three presidents to have that process fully started. Interesting, I didn't know that. What were you guys thinking about? What were you talking about? There's nothing else he did wrong, right? He's, he's innocent, he's good. Who? Monica Lewinsky? Who's that? She did what with his what? Number 10, King Edward VIII. Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how Everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. 
Yeah, Nostradamus, he may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age. They will change the kingdom and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings, or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members, but either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus's words very, very seriously out there, so I had to include it. Maybe there's something there, I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3. You know, maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, can Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what, that's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and it left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history. And well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it, I'm just saying, Kinda nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. And Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So on one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. Imagine, that's like some ancient Egypt. Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenley spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms, we woke up early, and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan just walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people watching at home or streaming it. And it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before. So of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that, and for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore. Which, more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little too. There's no way though, the guy can't even 
unlock his email, let alone sending one? No way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy. A princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, well, there's three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles. So everybody was busy looking at their directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see it go to theaters or anything. Kind of snuck by me while I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal. The bad boyal royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005, because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party, and, uh, a few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this, it's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night, it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards, he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out, no idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows the route in, and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What, like that's, that's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully 
he got caught. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have King Henry VIII. We'll start off this list with some 1500s dating drama. I love it. The fourth wife of Henry VIII, Anne of Cleves, was married to King Henry for six months. It was seen as quite strategic, actually. See, Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's duke, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein, famous painter, travel all the way to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like ancient Tinder. It's wild. This man compared portraits for a few days and then finally chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. He even compared her to a silver moon. I've never heard Taylor compare me to the silver moon, so it seems like he's gonna step his game up. So eventually a treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because when she arrived, she apparently looked nothing like the portrait. How horrible is that? It's 6 a.m., you just met your new husband after traveling upriver by barge, and the dude has the audacity to say you don't resemble a Victorian painting. Awesome. He even tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. Imagine still having to follow through. On January 6th, 1540, their marriage was official. But soon after, Anne gladly accepted the divorce, then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Historians believe that it was cancer. In our number nine spot today, we have King James. Before I dive into this one, guys, don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. It does really help us out. Not to be confused with LeBron James, this is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Quote, use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air to enter, and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick, you'll be well on your way. Like, bro, I have pneumonia, please help me. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick, so King James IV apparently just never took a bath, and his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by being in the same room as them. Even if he was in a room hours prior, Buddy would give you lice. Doesn't help that the guy had long hair. Guy's got Steven Tyler hair. It's like a lice lunchroom in here. Lice would emit off of this man. Margaret Tudor was married to King James the fourth, that must have sucked. So itchy. In our number eight spot today, we have King George V. When was the last time you saw a stamp? I haven't seen a stamp in months, but King George V, but he loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much. It was taking many hours out of his days, even when it shouldn't have been a priority at all. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everybody is trying to stay alive. George is just licking stamps in the library adding him to collections. Like all collections, the king started at an early age, but in the end of his days, George had albums and albums and albums, so many stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. That's so many stamps. In 1905, George set an all-time stamp record. It was the most money ever spent on a stamp. The man dropped like 220,000 on one stamp. That's some Logan Paul shit. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather, the King of Philady. That's the official term for collecting stamps. Some stamp jargon for ya. There you go, welcome to Bumblebee. We're learning, smash that thumbs up. In our number seven spot today, we have King Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector. Some princes collect stamps, others collect zoo animals. A Little more badass if you ask me. His castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep. He also collected human artifacts. So, yeah, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Imagine having company, don't step in lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Cheers! King Rudolf II, he's quite important in history. He supported the scientific revolution quite a bit. He also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff too, besides the kidneys and kangaroo collections. In our number six spot today, we have King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians, let's do it! King George IV was too invested in his intimate conquests. He was focused on all the wrong stuff and he was also just horrible about it. 
This king tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw tantrums if a crush wasn't interested, and sometimes he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get their attention. Super creepy, because on top of the lengths he would go to just to get some time alone, he also kept some of their hair after the dirty deed was done. Yeah, he would ask everybody he slept with for a lock of their hair. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair. Just envelopes of hair. The collection was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa. This insane collection is now in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want to feel sick. In our number five spot today, we have Christian the Seventh. Christian. An ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The young prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. Let's mention him. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, as I said, a wee young lad. And of course, a wee bit spoiled. Very comfortable with his body though, I'll say. More often than not, he would just have his hands in his pants. Middle of dinner, passing food around to his family, alternating hands in the pants to hands on food. This should have been number one, now that I think of it. What a little shit. It's unknown, but historians believe maybe he was a wee bit mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks so much. In our number four spot today, we have King Henry VIII. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII. He's pretty bad. Henry VIII was the King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times and they all went south. When Henry married Catherine Howard, he was 49 and Catherine was a lot younger. Classic 1500s stuff. After the two were married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had since received a nasty jousting wound to the face, was gravely overweight, and never wanted to do anything with Catherine. So Catherine, of course, just wanting some shred of a life and being, again, quite young, decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s. The young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. She was accused of cheating before they even got married and in turn lost her head. Horrible times. In our number three spot today, we have Don Carlos. Prince of Asturias in the mid 1500s, the Spanish prince who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was a horrible person. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him physically. That sucks on one hand, but it's how you deal with it and how you deal with others that shows what type of person you are, let alone leader. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, so right off the hop, easy promotion, all about who you know. Don Carlos would hurt people a lot. He would hurt animals for fun as well. As a true crime enthusiast, you know that's a red flag. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made somebody eat a pair of boots. We're not gonna feel bad for Don Carlos on Bumblebee today. No, sir. He was set up to marry Elizabeth of Valios, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's absolutely no way in hell, so she married his father instead, King Philip, in 1560. In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos, Mary Queen of Scots, Margaret of Valios, and Anne of, of Austria. When Carlos was plotting to take out his own father, he was caught and imprisoned in solitary confinement until his death six months later. In our number two spot today, we have the personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst job to have or the best. Here we go. Royals have been sweating constantly about people trying to take them out. Taylor's mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying. People are terrifying. Boy Jones would go through the queen's drawers. Big you. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate an attack, be as safe as you can be. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you ever heard about this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, and they also had a guy get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter. King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure his bed wasn't poisoned, so you were required to make the king's bed every morning. But you also had to rub all the sheets down before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure that they weren't poisoned. Sleep tight, all safe here. Don't mind the bad breath on all of your pillows. You're safe though. All right, time to clock out for the day. Clothes as well, that was touched. Maybe not kissed, but for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, no way I'd rather get poisoned. 
take my jeans off. In our number one spot today, we have King Louis XIV. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the royal household. Back in the olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier by using almond milk. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out the almond milk. Like, not again, Louis, come on. I just ain't, man. No. <laughs> Kicking off our list at number 10. Princess Diana. We'll start with a tragedy right off the gate. Here we go. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, he straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla right before his divorce from his first wife, Princess Diana. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed that relationship and what exactly happened. During that famous 1995 interview with BBC, she couldn't have said it better if I'm being honest myself. Diana said, very confidently, well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. That's a Princess Diana roast, folks. Oh no! Yeah, Princess Diana, she's full of roasts, apparently. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was a little busy, it seemed, and rightfully so. Diana's like, yeah, I'm not hanging out with this guy. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only a year before her tragic accident took her life. Later in 2005, he married Camilla. Yeah, has anybody seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looks great in that movie, and I wanna know if it's worth the watch. Comment down below. Number nine, The Great Fire. One of the most wild Nostradamus predictions of all time. It reads, the blood of the just will commit a fault at London, burnt through lightning of 23's the sixth. The ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. Now, there are of course many people who believe that this entry here was actually one that predicted the Great Fire of London that occurred in 1666. The line 23 is the sixth and times 20 by three, and then you add six, you get 66. Right, quick math. But most importantly, it may also mention London and the royal family. And in real life, this fire did affect them as well. Also, it is said by many that the reference to the lady here is another term for the kingdom, the lady. This means that Nostradamus was predicting, maybe, that the kingdom was going to fall as a result of the Great Fire. So, yeah, he kind of nailed it. I don't know. Number eight, King James. Not to be confused with LeBron James, although he's, he's a pretty good king as well. He's, he's all right, that fellow. This is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Don't do it or else you're a sinner, I guess. Use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, what? What did you just say? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles, like it's a Harry Potter spell, you know what I mean? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor is like, ah, yes, just a, a flower petal. We'll fix that. The doctor with one of these comes in. No way. Not listening to that guy. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick. So King James IV, apparently, he never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by walking by them. He would walk by and they'd be like, Ugh. Guy's got Steven Tyler's hair. What is that? Like, can we cut it if it's infected with gross? Can we just, maybe a bald king? How does a bald king sound? Number seven, King Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector of sorts. These, these royals, they like to collect things. They like to spend their money on weird things. Some princes collect stamps, other collect zoo animals. See, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans. So good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep, my friends. He also collected human artifacts, this royal, so that's a bit odd to collect when you're a royal. Imagine having company over, you're like, yeah, watch the lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Do you want a drink? Let me get you a drink. King Rudolph II, okay, he's quite important in history, obviously. He supported the scientific revolution a lot, and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff. Number six, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube doesn't like when I say some words, specifically a word that rhymes with Yahtzee. Mm -hmm. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, I have to mention it. The Duke was also referred to as a bad boy, but just how deep did these incidents cut? Was he like topless on a beach and he's bad, or was he dressed up as something horrible at a Halloween party? 
it was the latter. Before he settled down with Megan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology in 2005 because, huh, whoops, somebody got photos from that party. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No. Did he dress up like a witch? No, it would have been fun, but no. Photos leaked of him wearing a World War II German soldier outfit. Can't say much here, but it was even equipped with a specific armband. Yeah, we can't show you either, but you get what I'm saying. This was a not great time. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way. He's a royal and he does this instead. I don't know, it's very off-putting. Harry said afterwards, quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone, end quote. Wow, he, he really meant that one. Really came from the heart, that, that, that apology. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize, he says. Okay, number five, King Henry II. This is a quote that people believe was Nostradamus predicting the death of King Henry II, who actually was a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be scary. Hey, uh, how do I tell you this? Well, at one point, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible Henry King of France. Unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death at the age of 40. In the summer of 1559, a terrible jousting accident went awry and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I told you it because many think that Nostradamus predicted this. The jousting incident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and his skull by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. Yeah, he's jousting and then the eye, and then it happened. That sucks. Number four, Prince Charles the Vampire. Now, some of these theories, yeah, they're a bit out there. I didn't make them up. I wish I did, but I didn't. Some believers out there actually think Prince Charles is a vampire, a blood sucking, flying, turning into a bat looking vampire. I don't know. Why? Because Prince Charles is related to Vlad the Impaler. You know, that 15th century ruler who inspired the story of Dracula in Transylvania, who we're all pretty sure was a vampire. Now, it's a fun theory that went about, but Prince Charles having a piece of Romania is definitely helping out this case. I, we kind of believe this. The prince has been conserving forests and he even got property over there. So maybe he's a vampire, maybe not. Maybe he just likes property and castles. And Vlad the Impaler. I heard he's a great lad. A great Vlad. Number three, shapeshifters. Awesome. I'm not actually Taylor. I'm someone else pretending to be. That's cool. That's why I'm so energetic today. This next theory I wish I could claim for my own again, but it was actually former BBC presenter David Ick. He takes, the, he takes the cake himself. Here we go. He has since revealed himself as a conspiracy theorist, and one that surrounds the royal family had me stunned. Ick and quite a few others claim that the royal family is part of the Illuminati. Yeah, and then all of them earn their power because their human ancestor mated with reptilian aliens. They were clapping alien reptilians. That's how they became royals. That's the trick. You gotta clap some reptilian alien. David says the theory actually explains why royal families are obsessed with keeping their bloodlines clean with other royals. And you know, incest. <clears throat> but the biggest what the f part of all this has to be when David told the public that he knows people who have seen royal family members change into reptiles and then back into human form again. Number two, leaked letters. We'll end with some recent leaked letters. We love those, we love some gossip. We mentioned Princess Diana, well, we've got more stuff, we've got more tea. In May 2018, the royal wedding, it was thought at the time that Meghan's father was absent because of a heart attack that he suffered days before. But a year or so later, it's revealed that Thomas Markle and the new Duchess weren't as close. There was some, uh, there was some drama, there was some beef going on in the family. Thomas spoke out against his own daughter. There was a scandal where Meghan spoke to Oprah, the tell-all that we all watched, and Meghan actually said to her father that if you tell me the truth about what happened, about working with paparazzi, then we can help and get through it. But he wasn't able to do that, and that for me has really resonated. Yeah, if my dad was working with paparazzi, showing them private letters as well, just for clout, I'd be upset too, as if my dad can't even open his iPad without me, let alone leak my letters. Number one, personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst thing ever or the best, but it's, it's kept me laughing for months now. Royals have been sweating constantly about other people trying to, you know, take them out, right? It's a scary job, everyone wants to attack you. I mentioned Boyd Jones on here a few times, that guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying, people are terrifying. Boyd Jones would go through the queen's drawers and you know, big ooh. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate any and all attacks. Be as safe as you can be, right, of course. 
like the kissing sheets, for example. Oh, have you heard about these kissing sheets, this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, that's normal. But they also had a guy who would get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter, know what I mean? King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure the bed wasn't poisoned. So you were required to make the king's bed every morning, but you also had to rub all the sheets down everywhere before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure they weren't poisoned. Yeah, sleep tight. I'll sleep here, boss. Here we go. Don't mind the old medieval dad breath all over your pillows. You're safe for the night. That's so gross. I can't even sleep in a hotel sometimes, let alone some dude. I'm like, what are you doing? Get this guy out of here. Why is he kissing my bed? Clothes as well. That was also touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, kissing my sheets. No way. I think I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off. Get out of there. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series. We're past the first few episodes, and man, is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina, with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status, but some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long-serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote, trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident where, allegedly, 19-year-old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now, I do believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma, who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn-born brothers, and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn, and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies, with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity in all 
future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover-up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged essay situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment, and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today, we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs, and in them she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have to pay for his crimes. This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today, we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias in the mid-1500s, as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things, like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays, we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, it was like, I don't know. Was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number 5 spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although though it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although 
that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number four spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters in law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. Here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So, this already is some hot tea, but apparently, when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sister in law with these ladies. When she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal, and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short, and they were thrown in a dungeon. And even though Marguerite was meant to be the queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point. However, it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number three spot today, we have the Duggars. All right, one of the most famous reality TV families. And even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah, the show ran on TLC for seven years until it was canceled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, and their 19 children, nine daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently canceled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show, before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled, and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have, and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number two spot today, we have King Juan Carlos. The former King Juan Carlos of Spain, when he first ascended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay, fair enough. I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son, Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been a Quitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. A decision I make with sadness, but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years, and during all of them, I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today, we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the West 
Western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep, and they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculation swirl today, waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Kensington system. Queen Victoria's reign began in 1837, and it lasted up until her death in 1901. She was just 18 years old when she found herself on the throne, and it was all by chance, as she was actually fifth in line when she was born. This is all stressful enough, but certainly one of the worst parts of her upbringing was being brought up under the Kensington system. This basically all started when her mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created the system in order to control her daughter, literally just isolated her away from all of her friends and even from other family members, and apparently this was done to keep her quote unquote pure. The Duchess would monitor her every move, she would decide who she could see and who she could speak to, and Victoria only had two friends she could play with growing up, one being her half-sister and the other being her mother's attendant, Sir John Conroy. Victoria was even forced to share a room with her mother until she was queen. She couldn't even walk down the hall by herself. In the end, Victoria placed a lot of blame on John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She even called him the demon incarnate. In our number 9 spot today, we have the royal affairs. There have been many, many rumors over the years about the royal family and their extramarital affairs. Okay, I'm not saying it's a tradition, but it happens a lot, and I'm saying this goes way back. So far back that one of the first accusations of this within the royal family dates all the way back to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Since then, it has only continued with people such as Princess Margaret and Peter Townsend, Princess Anne and Commander Timothy Lawrence, and of course, King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla just to name a few. The latter of those definitely being the most famous, especially when the now king was confronted about it by his wife at the time, the beloved Princess Diana. Apparently, King Charles responded to the confrontation by saying, quote, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Maybe not the attitude to keep when you're speaking to your wife, who you're cheating on. I don't know. I guess I'm just not royal enough to get it. In our number 8 spot today, we have pets. As we all know very well, image is everything for the royal family, and that is down to the finest, smallest detail, including pets. It is well known that the queen absolutely loved corgis, and how could we possibly blame her? Apparently, however, if a dog is not a corgi or a Labrador, it is socially looked down upon. Can't describe how insane that is. They're dogs! If you brought a dog who had just been rolling around in the mud everywhere with you, I could see why that wouldn't be as widely accepted among fancy social circles, but only giving the choice of a few random breeds seems kind of ridiculous. Apparently, Meghan Markle actually had to give up her beagle named Guy a few years ago before she joined the family, and then left it. I guess she can probably have whatever dog she wants now, so there's always an upside. In our number 7 spot today, we have King Charles I. Okay, this is one that goes way back and it really creeps me out. So King Charles I, right now we're on the third, so we're taking it a couple back. King Charles I was tried for treason after the Civil War, and he ended up being beheaded in 1649. I guess in the 1600s, everyone was beheaded, so this wasn't necessarily abnormal, which is certainly weird, but that's a history lesson for another day. The weird part of this, however, is that apparently his head was sewn back on his body so that he could sit for a portrait, or it was perhaps supposed to be a sign of respect. Either way, it's very weird and very gross. I feel terrible for whoever's job it was to do that, and I also feel bad for the artist who was forced to paint that. Talk about traumatic. It does certainly make sense though that people say that Charles' ghost still haunts a building because there is no amount of haunting that could make up for being beheaded and then having your head sewn back onto your body. Okay, why'd we do the first part if we were gonna do the second? Could have just cut the middleman, you know? But instead, they cut his head off, okay? <laughs> in our number six spot today, we have never travel in pairs. 
This is one travel rule that certainly makes sense, but it is really dark when you think about it. This rule is one that the British royal family, and honestly many people who can afford this sort of luxury safety do nowadays. This tradition and rule is one that means that any heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together. This is of course in case some sort of accident happens, not every heir to the throne would be injured or perhaps killed. It's definitely very smart and sensible, but it has got to be grim, just constantly preparing for the worst thing to happen. It is of the utmost importance to the royal family that they preserve the line to the throne. Like I mentioned before, however, other people are now taking a page out of the royal book and are using this travel rule where possible. In our number 5 spot today, we have the black outfit. Another travel rule that the royal family must follow is in regards to an item that they have to bring with them on all trips, whether business or pleasure. It is pretty unusual to see the royal family dressed in black, despite what a specific occasion calls for it, but every time they travel, they're required to bring an all black outfit with them. This is to prepare for the worst case scenario. If they are away on a trip and somebody important to them passes away, they need to ensure that they are ready with the appropriate clothing for when they are able to touch down on their home soil. This is of course very practical, but it's definitely kind of morbid. I mean, you're having to fuss over what you're going to wear when you're actually just mourning the loss of someone close to you. It certainly wouldn't be the top of my list of things to focus on, but maybe that's why I'm not cut out for royalty. Okay. In our number four spot today, we have the rules of the road. Okay. This like rule or tradition or law, I guess, is probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard, but I guess it's been around for quite a while and I just had no idea. As it turns out, the monarch is the only person in the UK who is allowed to drive without a legal license or even license plates. Like, that's insane. I didn't expect the king to have to take a driver's test like everyone else, but just having a rule that allows them, if they chose to, to drive without any idea how? It's pretty bizarre. The good news is though, which makes this rule make a lot more sense, is that of course, rather than driving himself, King Charles' chauffeur will be much more responsible for most of the driving for the king. Let's just hope the chauffeur has their driver's license. I'm not gonna lie, there's this like silly photo of the queen, and every time I think about like the monarch driving without a license, I just think of this like little photo. She's got like a little silly grin on her face. She looks mischievous. And that's what I like to think, her just driving with no license. In our number three spot today, we have the armed forces. This is a tradition or system that comes into play when a new monarch comes into power. So last year, this happened with the king after the passing of the queen. It is definitely one of the most intimidating parts of his new role. And this is that King Charles now becomes the head of the armed forces. This means that it is his responsibility and he is the only person who can declare when the country is at war and when the war is over. Of course, he won't be doing this entirely alone. He needs to follow the advice and guidance of the government. The perhaps good news is that the new king has held quite close ties to the armed forces throughout his life, even spending time in the Royal Navy and taking flying instruction from the Royal Air Force during his second year at Cambridge University. Of course, the hope is that he won't have to be in a position to make these difficult decisions, but when or if he's faced with them, we can hope he makes the proper decisions for the country. In our number two spot today, we have no touching. There is a rule that you just cannot touch a royal. I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons for this, mostly to do with security, but aside from a very lucky handshake, you really are supposed to keep your distance. I suppose it's because I live the life of a regular person, but I kind of feel like in some ways this might be a little sad. I feel like you might be lacking in so much connection with a ton of interesting people. And like some of the people that you meet, wouldn't you just be dying to hug them? You know, apparently this is part of the reason why the queen always wore gloves. She of course shook a lot of hands while making her royal appearances, and the same will likely go for the new king. Maybe he'll take up gloves as a fashion accessory, just like his mother. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the church. We talked about the armed forces, and King Charles won't only be the head of the armed forces, but he will also become the head of the church in England. Quite a jump from talking about war and being the one who makes those kinds of decisions to being the head of the church where things hopefully are quite the opposite. This is a post that British monarchs have held since the church was founded by King Henry VIII in the 1500s, and it appears as though the tradition will carry on. In this role, it means that King Charles will be responsible for appointing archbishops and bishops to their role. The king will of course be advised in this role by the prime minister, and it is said that the king is religious in his own right, and that he has already spoken about how his personal faith has informed his approach to leadership. So to start, it's Genghis Khan. 
one. That's probably the most obvious start in this case. Good old Genghis was the ruler and emperor of the Mongol Empire, the largest empire in history. How do you do that? Well, even if they were outnumbered, which they usually were, the Mongols were masters of tactical and psychological warfare. They always had one time offer for any city or civilization they came across. If this people in the town surrendered, the Mongols would treat them well and allow them the fruits of a secure world. They had considerable personal liberty, religious freedoms, and an overall more rights. Once the Mongols were empowered, their land were safe and well controlled. If, however, the people resisted the Mongol advance, they and their cities would feel the full fury of the enraged invaders. The Mongols were violent, decapitating a path from the west shores of the Black Sea to the Pacific. Some experts calculate that fully 11% of the world's population died because of the Mongol expansion. He died in 1227 himself after defeating the Tanguts, and he left his successor and sons to handle everything. They don't think they were any better, however, his grandson told the Pope that he'd only protect Christian pilgrimage to Jerusalem if the Pope brought every king of Christendom to Khan to swear fealty. And his son committed one of the worst Mongol atrocities recorded against the Oryats. So I could go on, but we got more freaks to talk about. Your takeaway is don't mess with a Mongol. At Hardy fans, you'll know this one, the craze. Dramatized in the 2015 movie Legends, these identical twins are unique in comparison to other criminal empire leaders. They ruled East End London with an iron fist during the swing in 60s. Their criminal empire depended on robbery and protection rackets to thrive. The craze and their associates would ensure compliance by readily resorting to arson, assault, and killings. The fear they inspired stopped even the most cowardly of snitches from saying a peep. They operated out of a nightclub and they were familiar figures on the street. But the streets are different during the day and surprising to many, ordinary people who were untouched by the craze business interests actually revered them. They acted as a sort of local authority, helping people with their problems, debts, hurtful spouses, or failing homes. They guaranteed safety on the street and delivered it. It wasn't even just the ordinary people that admired the Cray brothers, but celebrities and politicians too. The police arrested them in 1968 after Ronnie's mental decline caused by his refusal to take medication led to the operation to make some sloppy mistakes. AKA, he literally killed two people at separate public events. Two occasions, guys. Ronnie was sent to a high security psychiatric facility due to his instability, but also his homosexuality. Unfortunately, that's how the times were. He died in 1995 while his brother died in 2000, five weeks after authorities released him from prison on a compassion ground for his terminal cancer. This Spanish family has lurid tales, but are, are they fact or are they fiction? The Borgias. Originally from Spain, the family became important in 15th century political and religious world. Caesar, the Borgias patriarch's father, was elected pope in 1492 of the titular church of Santa Maria Nova, making Caesar the archbishop and later the cardinal in 1492. Caesar, however, had no interest in religious vocation. He was better known as the papa court for his hunting parties and amorous liaisons and flashy clothes rather than meticulous religious observations. On the death of Pedro Luis in 1488, the title of Duke of Granda had been handed past him and gone to his younger brother Juan. When Juan was mysteriously murdered in 1497, the rumor gradually spread that Cesar was the culprit. Ambitious and hungry for yet more power, the family included two popes, one of which was Alexander, the father of the famous Lucrezia. Her family was perfectly happy to use her as a pawn in their power plays. She entered into several arranged marriages, each one helped the, Bar the Borgias extend their grip. She's also what inspired the belief that they really kept it in the family. After retiring to Napi after being a professional wife, Giovanni, dubbed the Roman infant, is seen at approximately age three for the first time. Two papal bulls recognize the child as an illegitimate son of first Caesar, her uncle, and then of Alexander, her dad, who probably was the true father. The mysterious origin of the child, as well as her presence at a celebrated night group romp in the Vatican has been used to support the rumors. You can learn more about this disastrous family in a three season TV drama literally named after them, the Borgias. Time to take life insurance policies out. We're meeting the Castro Angel Landing family. Ah, cult. You know there had to be at least one coming up. They love to call themselves families after all. Angel's Landing is the name of a 20 acre compound outside of Wichita, Kansas where Lou Castro and a small group of people lived an inexplicably extravagant life in the early 2000s. His followers were convinced he was an angel seer who saw the future and knew how people were going to die. Turns out the reason he knew was because he was going to be the one making it happen. Patricia Hughes showed up dead in 2003 and police turned their attention to the secluded luxury compound. There were high end vehicles and appliances, well kept lavish homes, pools, and just a lot of wealth that wasn't accounted for or could be explained. Then Patricia's husband dies in 2006 on compound once again by a freak accident and Ron Goodwin dived into every bit of personal and financial information he could find on the people living at Angel's Landing. Turns out
that our buddy Castro took out expensive life insurance policies on certain cult members and had them cashed in by other members when someone in the makeshift family accidentally died. This pattern occurred around every two years and for about a decade unnoticed. Turns out his name wasn't even Luke Castro, but Daniel Perez, a man from Texas with many police reports. Perez was charged with 28 felonies and in February 2015 he was convicted on all counts and sentenced to 80 years in prison. The cult was later profiled on an episode of Oxygen's Deadly Cult. Next up is Lucky Luciano. We love a fun and flirty nickname, one he earned for success at evading arrest and winning craps games. Lucky was the most powerful chief of American organized crime in the early 1930s and a major influence even from prison and after deportation to Italy. At 10 he was already involved in muggings, shoplifting, extortion. After a 6 month jail sentence when he was a teen, Lucky teamed up with Frank Costello and Mayor Lansky and other young gang and later New York's rising crime boss Joe Masseria, who he becomes second hand man to. In October of 1929 he becomes the rare survivor of a one way ride when he's abducted by four men in a car, beaten, stabbed, had his throat slit from ear to ear and was left for dead. But he survived and never named his abductors. Metal. Lucky had carefully nurtured his contacts with the young powers and had become the boss of all bosses without ever accepting or claiming the title. By 1934, he and the leaders of other crime families had developed the National Crime Syndicate. In 1936, Lucky was indicted, tried, and convicted for his brothels and call girl empire and was sentenced to Clinton Prison for a 30 to 50 year term. From his cell, he continued to rule and issue orders, and in 1942, the luxury liner Normandy was destroyed in the New New York Harbor and Navy intelligence sought Luciano's help in tightening waterfront security. Lucky gave the orders and sabotage on the docks ended and in 1946 his sentence was commuted and he was deported to Italy where he settled in Rome. He then bounced from Cuba to Naples and continued his crime empire until he died of a heart attack in an airport in Naples, Florida in 1962. A family gang of four so ferocious they have a catchy nickname to prove it, the Benders. The Benders settled in isolated Labet County, Kansas in the early 1870s following the new spiritualism movement. This is because Kate in her early 20s was renowned for performing seances that showed off her psychic abilities at the store inn that the family ran. But this wasn't as picturesque as it seems. Historians are very confident that the Benders, living as a husband, wife, young adult son, young adult daughter dynamic, actually weren't even related and none of them were even named Bender. And well it'd be no biggie if it wasn't for the fact so many people who happened to pass through Labette County never made it to their final destinations, including a well known local doctor William York. After a community meeting about York, attended by both of the male benders, it resulted in a search party formation and it was soon noted that the bender homestead appeared recently abandoned and full of evidence. Near the table where the guests were served was a trap door and the foul smelling hole beneath the door was just full of blood and gross stuff. The ground in an or orchard nearby the house has been carefully plowed but one small section was noticeably indented. The ground was dug up and revealed the decomposed body of Mr. York. Eight more bodies are found, skulls crushed, throats cut. Guests at the inn were urged to sit at the place of honor, which was a curtain dividing the house's rooms. While dining, the guest of honor would be hit in the head with a hammer from behind the curtain, his throat cut, and then his body dropped in the trap door to the cellar Sweeney Todd style. Their motive? Robbery or the thrill of it? Nobody actually knows, because despite a reward and several substantial claims of their capture at the hands of various posses, the benders appear to have gotten away with it, and their grim story continues to intrigue. One of the few mafiastos to be executed is Louis Lepke Butchialter. Nicknamed Lepkele, Little Louis in Yiddish, then shortened to Lepke, this crime boss was a quiet man for years managed to avoid public spotlight. In conversations with criminal associates, Lepke preferred listening over talking. He was an overall nice man, appreciated by the community for how he aided his neighbors. He generously compensated his crew members and took them to hockey games, boxing matches, and even winter cruises. He married a widower named Betty and adopted Betty's child from the previous marriage. In the early 1930s, Lepke created an effective process of performing contract killings for the Cosa Nostra mobsters. It had no name but the press 10 years later called it Murder Inc. The Cosa Nostra mobsters wanted to insulate themselves from any connection to these killings. So Lepke's partner would relay the contract request from the Costra to Lepke who would assign it to a street member who had no connections with any major crime family. If 
they were caught, they could not implicate the Costra members in the crime. They were soon completing jobs all over the country for their mobster bosses, grossing over one million in profit per year. Ultimately, Lefke is cornered and forced to surrender after three years of hiding when the killing of Joseph Rosen, an informant, goes awry. He's tried for the killing of Rosen alongside three other murders, and Lefke is found guilty and sentenced to death. He exhausts his four appeals, but is executed by electric chair in 1944. You never know your neighbors, especially if they were Inessa, Roman, and their daughters. Inessa, a kindergarten teacher, and Roman, a successful dentist. Together, Inessa's daughters from her first marriage, 25-year-old Victoria, and just shy of legal daughter Anastasia, are responsible for the violent deaths of at least 30 people across southern Russia. Inessa and her family were highly organized, using information from Roman's sister and brother-in-law who had police connections to organize their crimes around police activity. This is because Inessa liked to go after police officers as one had left her for another woman in the past. And her current husband didn't feel like she was living in the past either? Okay, alright. Their victims weren't exclusively police officers, however. The family MO was breaking and entering the houses of sleeping families while they road tripped under the guise of going on monthly camping trips. One victim was a police officer named Ivan, who was killed when he attempted to stop members of the gang from fleeing the scene of the crime. Roman was eventually killed in a bloody standoff with police, and Inessa was arrested. A search of the family home uncovered a slew of weaponry, a complete arsenal. Inessa, Anastasia, and Victoria all confessed to their crimes, the six-year reign ending. Vladimir Markin, the chief of Russia's equivalent to the FBI, said, I'm sure that when they were together, one could hardly imagine that they could even plan a crime. It sounds so much more innocent than it is, the Bean Clan. Picturesque Scotland, a land of mystery and rolling dewy fields, glens, and hills that 100% have eyes. That's right, we're talking about the freaks who inspired the nauseating horror movie that we're never gonna forget anytime soon. Back in the 16th century, Alexander Bean and his partner, Black Agnes Douglas, set up home in a hidden sea cave and started popping out babies. Why? I don't know. Why a cave? Again, I don't know. Maybe they just wanted the saltiest and driest sinuses and intercourse ever. Well, the weirdos never left that cave and they never let any of the kids leave it either. By keeping it in the family, the clan eventually grew to about 45 members, all starting from just the two. Jobs were hard to come by when you're not part of society and potentially terrifying looking from inbreeding, so why not just murk and eat travelers whenever you're feeling peckish or want a new shirt? That's exactly what they did, operating only at night and retiring to their cave by day where they could enjoy a roasted meal of unfortunate victims and rest like weird hick vampires. Locals had no idea what was going on because they weren't being picked away at like croutons from the veggie tray and the Bean Clan survived doing this for 25 years, munching down on what's estimated to be about a thousand people. Naturally, it eventually gets found out by the locals and they decide to do an old fashioned mob style on this one. They descend on the cave and cut the off the men, followed by their hands and feet, leaving them to bleed to death. Everyone else was burnt alive. I'm sure if they could have, these weirdos would have attended their own massacre just to snack on their own cooking remains. And now the most dysfunctional family in history, the Ptolemies. The last dynasty of Greek Egypt, their first three monarchs of the dynasty were capable, vigorous sorts that did things like build the great library at Alexandria on their weekends off. But from the 4th century forward, it was nightmarish. It's like they were on a game show where you tried to kill as many of your close relatives as you were able, preferably in as painful and public of a way as possible. This is complicated for two reasons. One, they kept the names in the family, men were always named Ptolemy, and women, nine times out of ten, were called Cleopatra. Two, they kept their seed in the family too, following the Egyptian tradition, brother and sister wed and had children. This means it's not easy to explain who is killing whom. What follows offered is a kind of prose poem compiled of examples dedicated to the most bestial family in history. Alright, so, Platonomy 5 was the nicest of the later Platonomies and thoughtfully had his mother's killers ripped apart by a mob. Platonomy 6 fought his own brother for the throne and then married his sister Cleopatra 2. Platonomy 4 kills his mom who had killed her husband for having a love affair with her mother. Platonomy 8 was a great enemy of Platonomy 6 and the probable killer of Platonomy 7. He also married Cleopatra 2 and then began an affair with Cleopatra's daughter Cleopatra 3. So Platonomy 8 had Platonomy 6 dismembered and the pieces sent to the mother Cleopatra 2. I could keep going, like for hours. They burnt, burnt, cooked, eviscerated, literally anything you can think of, they did to one another. All of this comes down to the bottom of the family tree, Cleopatra 7, the daughter of Platonomy 12, the famous Caesar-loving, Mark Anthony-loving Cleopatra who blew Egypt out of the water. I need a water break after that. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have Cleopatra and Ptolemy the 8th. We'll head over to 47 BC, at a time where ancient Egypt was 
a little different. We often think of Cleopatra's end, but the beginning of her life was quite hectic as well, even for the royal family. Cleopatra had two younger brothers who both ruled with her after the death of their father, Ptolemy the Twelfth. Ptolemy the Thirteenth initially ruled with Cleopatra; they were a historical duo, but they soon became rivals. Ptolemy wanted the throne to himself, so he attempted to seize control of Egypt. This led to a civil war in which Cleopatra was exiled. However, after Caesar defeated Ptolemy's army and restored Cleopatra to the throne, Ptolemy the Thirteenth drowned in the Nile River while attempting to flee a battle. Talk about family drama. I thought mine was bad, but dang. In our number 9 spot today we have King Henry VIII. Henry's marriages were significant in the history of England because they played a major role in the English Reformation and the establishment of the Church of England as a separate entity from the Catholic Church. Yeah, a few of those family scandals ought to do it. Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife, he quickly divorced after she failed to produce a male heir. Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife, who he of course married immediately after his divorce from Catherine, a little sketchy, well she was later accused of adultery and treason and lost her head. It wasn't good. Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife, gave him this long-awaited male heir, Edward VI. Sadly, she died soon after giving birth. Next was Anne, Henry's fourth wife, whom he married for political reasons but found unattractive and divorced shortly after. He saw a painting of her before and she didn't match the image. Swear to God that's what happened. Like, what in the tinder? This guy is absolutely insane. Next was Catherine Howard, Henry's fifth fifth wife who was only 17 at the time. She was accused of adultery and also lost her life. Catherine Parr, Henry's sixth and final wife, survived him for a change and went on to marry again after his death. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived, alright? Study that for your history test. In our number 8 spot today we have Julia the Elder. Julia Caesaris was the only biological child of Roman Emperor Augustus. She was born in 39 BC and was married to Marcus Claudius Marcellus, but later got caught up in a series of scandals that brought shame to her family. So much so that her father actually exiled her to a small island off of the coast of Italy in 2 BC. She remained in exile for several years and her marriage to Marcellus was annulled. In 2 AD, Augustus allowed her to return back to the mainland, but she was still considered an outcast and was forced to live in seclusion for the rest of her life. This was less than 10 years after her mother had suffered the same fate. What an absolute nightmare. In our number 7 spot today we have King James I. We're taking it back to Scotland in 1425. King James I ordered the death of a powerful nobleman who just also happened to be James' cousin. Murdoch Stuart, Duke of Albany, was the grandson of King Robert II and had served as regent for James while he was imprisoned in England. However, once James returned to Scotland, he suspected Murdoch of plotting against him. Murdoch and several of his followers followers were arrested and killed in Stirling Castle. King James' actions were seen as a ruthless demonstration of his power and authority, and he faced quite a bit of criticism for this harsh treatment. In our number 6 spot today we have John the Fearless. In 1407, Duke of Burgundy John the Fearless ordered the death of Duke of Orleans, Louis I, aka John's cousin. A lot of like cousin rivalries in this list. At the time, of course, he was his political rival in the French court, but what is happening? The two men were powerful and influential members of the French nobility, and their feud had been building for quite some time. See, John believed that Louis was a threat to his power, and he had also insulted him publicly, which for sure doesn't help the case. Louis was ambushed and killed by a group of armed men in the streets of Paris. John was heavily criticized for his actions and the incident even went as far as to spark a civil war in France. The conflict lasted for several years and resulted in political instability and sadly, lots of lives lost in France. In our number 5 spot today we have the Brutal Benders. Uh, also known as the Bloody Benders, if their name didn't hint towards it, they were a family of who operated in Labette County, Kansas in the late 19th century. The family consisted of John Bender, his wife Elvira, and their adult children Kate and John Jr. They ran a small inn and a general store that became a popular stop for travelers passing through the area. However, the family was also known to rob and or kill their guests. Just a minor inconvenience if you want to stop in at the inn. They would lure travelers into their home, act friendly, and then completely switch on them. The family's crimes were eventually discovered in 1873, but they fled the area before they could be brought to justice. Lovely. 
What year was this again? I don't think they're alive anymore, thank God. Well, who knows? In our number four spot today, we have Fred and Rose West. We've heard of Bonnie and Clyde, but what about Fred and Rose West? Ugh. The two were a married couple who committed a series of brutal and killings in England during the 1970s and 80s. Their victims were usually women, and they buried their bodies in and around their home. The couple was thankfully arrested in 1994 after police discovered the remains of several victims. While awaiting trial, Fred took his own life in prison. Rose was found guilty of killing 10 people and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Definitely one of the worst when it comes to British criminal history. In our number three spot today, we have the Cray twins. Ronnie and Reginald Cray. Where do I even begin here? On paper, these twins were lavish, they had very bubbly personalities, and were often associated with celebrities and politicians. Deep down, these British gangsters were much, much more. The Cray twins operated in London's East End during the 1950s and 1960s. They were involved in organized crime like protection rackets, arson, and they took a handful of lives. They were eventually arrested and sentenced to life in 1969 for killing Jack Mc Vitti and George Cornell. The Cray's legacy has been depicted in many films, books, and documentaries, and they remain among the most notorious figures in British criminal history. In our number two spot today, we have King Rudolf II. We'll do a little palate cleanser before we finish off out with big bad number one. King Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor in 1552. He was known as the collector of sorts. Some royals collect stamps, others collect zoo animals. Okay. His home was dangerous, to say the least. His castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting eight hours of sleep. Not gonna happen. He also liked to collect human artifacts. That one's a little bit more jarring than the zoo animals, right? I mean, literally, King Rudolf II had random bones and body parts in jars, all in the name of science. Watch out for the animal droppings and the jars of teeth. Welcome home. King Rudolf II is, of course, quite important in history as he supported the scientific revolution quite a bit, hence the jars, you know? He also poured tons of money into astrology. He's into the cosmos and the kidneys. What a guy, all right? It's got a lot of interests. In our number one spot today, we have Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. We'll end on our least favorite Canadian couple, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. They committed a series of brutal assaults and killings in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Their victims included Homolka's sister, as well as several other young women. Absolutely disgusting. Disgusting. Bernardo was known for his inhumane acts in Scarborough. He even had a nasty nickname for them before his true, even more disgusting identity was revealed. The couple has since been dubbed the Ken and Barbie killers due to their Wonder Bread appearance. Homolka had made a plea with prosecutors testifying against Bernardo in exchange for a reduced sentence. Meanwhile, Bernardo was eventually convicted of several charges and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Hashtag by Ken. Starting with Daisy and her pearls for number 10. Daisy of Pless was a beloved British princess, like Princess Diana of her time. Unconventional, playful, yet stunningly beautiful, she was highly cultivated in the public eye, but after World War II, it was one of her necklaces that demanded attention, quickly becoming one of the most wanted artifacts of its time. A pearl necklace given to her by her husband Hans, who she had married in 1891. The necklace was 22 feet long and one of the most expensive necklaces in the world. In fact, so expensive, it cost a human life, as legend says that the necklace was cursed by the pearl diver who suffocated while collecting them. Maybe it's why she and her husband divorced. Well, not fully, because we know that's partly due to a rumor about Daisy and William II caused by her being the go-between for him and a King Edward at the time. Fun side note though, the ex-hubby Hans goes on to marry Clotilde, of whom he has two children and nine years of marriage, before they annul, and Clotilde marries her stepson, Bolko, the son of Daisy and Hans, and proceeds to give them their only grandchild. Fun family gatherings, I imagine. Anyways, after that weird little bump came World War I. Daisy served as a nurse and touched the hearts of Europeans by offering her help to soldiers on both sides of the conflict. Then came World War II and many nobles were supporting Schmittler, but Daisy wasn't about it. Instead, she was active in the support and escape of prisoners from Gross Rosen, earning her the German enemy status and eviction from her properties in Poland. She actually died in rural Poland on June 29th of 1943. Due to research by the foundation of Daisy Plus, we know that Daisy sold 
sold most of her pearls in 1936. Her son Bolko was arrested by the Gestapo for unknown reasons and he was tormented relentlessly for two months and only left the prison when his mother paid the NSDAP a huge amount of money. Money she'd gotten from cutting her beloved pearl strand and selling most of the stones. Sadly, the young man died because of his injuries caused anyways. But according to Daisy's grandson, if she was buried with the necklace, it wasn't more than one meter left of pearls. If not, the pearls location's a true mystery. And what better place to lay than number nine, the bed of wear, AKA the bed that doesn't want you in it. I guess it just wants to stand there and look pretty. Earn its title, the most famous bed in British history. Man, what are you guys doing over there that that's a classification? No wonder you had to steal everyone else's artifacts for your museums. <laughs> anyway, the story goes that this bed was made in the 15th century for our boy King Edward the, uh, I think that's the fourth, by a carpenter named Jonas Fosbrook. Made of rich, sturdy oak, carved, pruned, and plucked for a royal king, it's said that the bed is so large it can comfortably sleep four couples. All right, Edward, I see what you were up to there. He ain't slick. However, at some point in time, the bed found itself out of the castle and being passed around the inns like a princess turned working girl. As it circulated the inns of Ware, England, where commoners were able to sleep in it and cover it in graffiti, the disrespect and defacing of this regal item angered the ghost of Fosbrook. And now it said the carpenter has cursed this bed and his spirit may attack any commoner who tries to sleep in it since he made it for noble blood only. So I guess if you wanna find out if you have noble blood, go take a nap. If something is called a trumpet of war, I think you'd better not blow it as proven in number eight. It's 1922, you bust into an ancient underground tomb that has a big sign on it that says, please don't bust into this tomb or ghosts will kill you. And inside it's got all this treasure and amazing stuff just chock full of curses. Curses everywhere. But you see two big ass bronze horns literally called trumpets of war and the light bulb that goes off in your head is, I'm gonna play these for the world to hear on BBC Radio. Anyways, yeah, these excited dummies decide to take an item that the Egyptians used as an announcement of war and death and literally a horrific guttural wail of a sound and play it for the world in 1939 on BBC Radio. And it seemed that the universe took that announcement quite seriously as it was only a couple months after that World War II broke out. Naturally, as the deaths of those on the excavation team were being chalked up to a curse, so was this. Moral of the story, stop touching Tut's stuff and get out of his room. Let's talk about a cursed amethyst for number seven. Shout out to all my amethyst birthstones, call them purple pals. Anyways, this cursed rock starts its life in the temple dedicated to the god Indra in India. Shocker, seeing as pretty much every cursed gem out there, such as the Hope Diamond or the Kore Nor Diamond is stolen from India. And it's almost like there's a correlation between stealing gems and then the gems becoming death herring spite rocks. Who do you know? Anyway, so a British soldier, Colonel W. Ferris snatched the stone and his health immediately goes to crap and he suddenly starts to go broke. He dies and the amethyst goes to his son, who then also loses all his money and becomes terminally ill. In an attempt to recover, he sends the stone to his friend to hold onto it, which the friend does do, right up until they take their own life and mail it right on back. The stone bounces to 19th century polymath Edward Heron Allen. He was skeptical at first, thus why he accepted the stone when many wouldn't, but regretted that quickly as his luck became unfathomably bad, even extending to family and friends such as a close acquaintance and professional singer who lost her voice one night after visiting and seeing the stone. Heron Allen tried to get rid of it as a result, throwing it in the canal, selling it, but it continuously returned to him. After the birth of his daughter and not wanting to take any risks, he decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of strict instructions not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death and his daughter could never hold or touch it. Less than a year after his death, however, his daughter donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum. Next up is all too famous, it's the Terracotta Army, number six. Many scholars believe that the Terracotta Army was never meant to be seen by the living. For centuries it existed as a myth, but the sudden discovery of a warrior by the farmers seeking groundwater unearthed a literal necropolis. And since then it's been nothing but a curse to those who found it and their community right nearby. Qin Shu Hong feared death and became obsessed with finding the elixir of life. Unfortunately, he thought murk was one of the key ingredients. Instead, it's what kills him in his late 40s. But by this time, he'd long prepared his tomb. It took 36 years and 700,000 workers to create the massive underground bunker that contained over 8,000 terracotta figures. The Chinese government had no intention to open the tomb until scientists can find a way to keep it preserved in the process, but they access and study what they can. Meanwhile, the men who discovered the warriors told Swiss News in 2013 that many of the older people in the village believe that disturbing them would bring misfortune. When the older ones saw these statues of gods and the bronze objects we had dug up, they weren't at all pleased. They said they were part of the local feng shui and that digging them 
up would do no good to either the village or to us. For the seven men who encountered the terracotta army, this was downright prophetic. As news spread of the emperor's tomb, the government came to claim their farmland and demolish their homes for excavations, museum space, and souvenir shops. Among the well diggers, one took his life, while others died in poverty or had to resort to signing books about the discovery for meager pay. This king's wealth caused a gold fever, number five. 363 Lydian artifacts, all dating back to the seventh century, are found in the Usak province of Turkey in 1966. And all 363 pieces have been nothing but trouble since. Now called the Kudon treasure, it's also known as the Krosius treasure, in reference to the Lydian king from the sixth century BC. No matter what you call it, locals only call it trouble. Lydia was a huge Iron Age kingdom existing from 15th to 14th century BCE to almost 545 BC, but by the first century BCE, almost all of their culture and existence was lost. The Karun treasure is automatically a massive historical, well, gold mine. It was discovered, retrieved, and sold by the villagers of Midiki, which after the government had to play track and trace to get it back. The battle between the Turkish government and the New York Met Gallery lasted from 1987 to 1993. When the Americans lose, they send back all 363 pieces, or at least the Turkish government thought. Turns out the old switcheroo was pulled, and in 2006, one of the artifacts is identified as a forgery. Now, nobody can say for sure how many are fakes. So, what is the curse connected to the famous treasure? Gold fever. Legends say that people get sick from the treasure, and they can't apparently stop themselves from trying to get a piece of it. Meaning they'll do just about anything, including a decade-long legal battle, and swapping out the real pieces for forgeries, or 43 years after its discovery, the director of the USAC Museum being arrested under suspicion that he had stolen some of the artifacts from the collection, or the nine other similar arrests that have been proven to date. Stairwell to maybe the heaven is number four. Don't know if it qualifies as a artifact, maybe a super large object, whatever. It's the Queen's House of Royal Museum's Greenwich, home to the first geometric self-supporting spiral stair in Britain. An absolutely hilarious note about this property is that also kicked off the curse of the Loveless Palace is that the house was commissioned by King James I in 1619 for his wife, Anne of Denmark, as an elaborate apology for him swearing at her in public. If anything, I believe his verbal response to be quite measured considering his wife had just accidentally shot one of his dogs. So The queen, however, fell ill and died in 1619. At this point, the first floor was completed and hastily capped off. During the reign of Charles I, the construction was started again once more, this time in dedication to his own wife, Queen Henrietta Maria, but this time it was interrupted by the English Civil War and the house is abandoned again, later to be repurposed to hold war prisoners. After the war, it became a boarding school, then a hospital school, then finally a National Maritime Museum. It seems that the building, initially meant for a gesture of love to make up for something foul, never got to be anything but foul, and was cursed to remain a loveless place. I'd make a Lord of the Rings reference if I knew any. Number three is the Stolen Ring. Once upon a time in 4th century AD, Roman nobleman Sylvanius was stationed in Gloucestershire, England. The whole phrase is when in Rome, so Sylvie must have taken that mindset and applied it to when in Gloucestershire because he chose to go to the elaborate baths dedicated to the Celtic god Nodens, a deity associated with healing, hunting, and dogs, a real man's man. When Sylvie was at the temple, he took off his gold ring and left it on the side of the pool with his belongings, where it was stolen from him. Sylvie believed that it was Senecanius who stole it, as he was the only other person there at the time. Instead of going, yo buddy, hand it over, Sylvie, super casual and laid back, goes to the Nodens temple and prepares a lead curse tablet which he inscribed with, for the god Noden, Sylvianus has lost a ring and has donated one half its worth to Nodens. Among those names, Senecanius permit no good health until it is returned to the Temple of Nodens. Both this ring and this tablet are found separately in history, yet it's in 1929, archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler saw a connection between the two. Well, it can't be entirely confirmed, however, Seni is an unusually specific name, and the close dates of the artifacts seem to support the theory. So, just to double check, Wheeler asked his friend J.R.R. Tolkien to help clarify what obscure god Nodens was and what role he might have played in history of the ring. As a result, it's believed that the ring of Senecarnius was the inspiration for the ring in The Hobbit. Number two has got to be my favorite. It's the cat fur rug. That's right, a cat fur rug with a picture of a cat on it, all gift wrapped up around a mummified foot. Doesn't that sound like a real treat? This rug is sometimes referred to as the sacred cat rug and has the title of the oldest rug in the world. But aside from being ancient, not much else is known, as this artifact was purchased from treasure hunters who had plundered multiple sites without rhyme or reason, losing valuable excavation opportunities. When it was bought in 1913, the 2400 year old rug had a mummified human foot wrapped inside of it. The relation between this mummified foot and the 
cat hair rug is completely unknown. The rug, having come from Egypt, is believed to have been removed from a royal tomb or a royal temple, however, and it may have had a ritualistic purpose, especially given the not so subtle worship of cats found in ancient Egypt. The loom weaved fur and the image on the rug are that of an African wildcat, but it's the curse that really makes things spicy. A papyrus inscription had allegedly come with the rug, but like the foot and who knows what else, lots of parts of this got lost thanks to illegal sales. It is alleged that anyone who is careless enough to step on this rug would die shortly after. Whilst it's unknown if this curse is true since nobody's trying to step on the rug and find out, apparently when the rug was last restored, a dead cat was found stretched out on the front steps of the museum in the morning. Last but never the least, number one is the story of the Jade Seal. According to legend, a man named Bian He found a giant stone containing the largest piece of jade in the land. He recognized its value and brought it to the ruler of Chu, named King Li. Li thought it was a useless rock, and insulted by the waste of time, ordered Bian's foot be cut off. When King Li died, Bian tried again with the new king, Wu. But this monarch also thought it was just a stone, and like his father, ordered the man's other foot to be cut off. When Wu died, the crown passed to his son, Wen. Bian He carried the jade stone to the foot of Mount Chu. There he cried until, to quote, after three days and three nights, his tears were all exhausted and blood flowed out. At this news, King Wen sent men to ask him the reason. I am lamenting not the loss of my feet, said Bian in reply, but for the calling of a precious gem, an ordinary stone, and for their dubbing an honest man a liar. This is the reason I am lamenting. Impressed by Bian's adamancy, King Wen ordered the royal jeweler to cut and polish the stone. Lo and behold, inside was the largest piece of pure jade the king had ever seen, and in honor of what Bian He did to uncover the precious jade, King Wen called the piece He She Be, meaning He's Jade Disc. Then in 283 BC, the precious jade was stolen from the king of Chu and sold to the state of Zhao, and the king of Qin offered Zhao 15 cities for the jade. King of Zhao realized it was a trap and steals the jade back from the Qin, but the Qin dynasty would have its revenge. So in 221 BC, Qin Shi Huang conquered the six warring states, including Zhao. Victorious, Qin ordered the jade to be carved so the most fantastic piece of jade would forever serve as the Qin imperial seal. Legend has it that the jade was inscribed with the words, having received the mandate of heaven, may the emperor lead a long and prosperous life. And since that moment it was carved, it is being cursed. From 221 BC onward, the heirloom seal of the realm passed from emperor to emperor. But when the Ming dynasty came into power in 1368, it had vanished. There are several theories as to what happened to the seal, and every now and then someone claims to have found it, but nothing's been confirmed thus far. Number 10 is Eric the 14th. That's a lot of Eric's to get to 14, and it's a lot of paranoia in his case. The Swedish king survived three years of ruling before he lost his mind, first taking the throne in 1560, and then having his life taken in 1577. In 1563, when the crazy struck, Eric became violent and paranoid, rubbing his nobility and court members the wrong way until he pulled a daring move, imprisoning the Sturz noble family for allegedly plotting against him. However, he quickly came to the conclusion that the incarceration wasn't enough and decided to have them killed instead. Eric himself himself participates in their grisly deaths, and after their death sentences, Eric wandered outside to the woods and disappeared for three days. This led to open conflict between Sweden's nobility and Eric, who was eventually dethroned and imprisoned by his despised half-brother John in 1569. The former king languished in prison for the next seven years before being put out of his misery in 1577. Turns out Eric's paranoia may have been onto something. After the 20th century exhumation, forensic scientists determined Eric died from his pea soup being poisoned. Number Number nine is the Glutton, a nickname for King Afonso, also called the Grinning Moron. A nickname he earned from doing things like wearing six hats at once, tiered Mad Hatter style, or because he visited all the nunneries around to offer himself up as a willing bedmate. This is also the king who famously saw his two older siblings die, and instead of crying, he cheered and went, hooray, now I will be the king of Portugal. All of this perceived madness allegedly comes from how Afonso was ill as a child, and it left him partially paralyzed and mentally unstable. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, he found pleasure in violence, and this made for a bad combination, especially when a local boy named Antonio, who liked to whip stones at people, offered the king knives and said he should join. Alfonso's mother tried to stop her son, who now went out at night and tormented the poor villagers, and forbade Antonio to enter the palace. Deprived from Antonio's company, Alfonso became completely unmanageable and refused to eat food like a brat. So they let Antonio back in. He soon established himself in a room next to Alfonso and began to lead the king on nightly excursions, jumping respectable citizens, and raiding taverns. This goes on for years until his mother dies and Antonio is sent away. Then Afonso focuses his attention onto food. At the age of 23, Afonso was incredibly large thanks to gluttony. He 
used to take his meals in bed and usually ate and drank so much he was sick afterwards. Ministers ruled on behalf of the screw loose Afonso for years, but they still tried to make Afonso behave like a king. Told what to do, he did it. Told what to say, he said it. Still, his way of life infuriated the Portuguese clergy, so they find him a wife, hoping it'd calm him down. Instead, they annul, and she marries his younger, hotter brother, and the two begin planning a coup. In his final days, like many of the other monarchs on this list, he was confined. It was said he wore a groove in the floor from pacing since he couldn't do anything else. Number eight is Snotty King. Unlike Afonso, who victimized the nearby villages, France's King Charles IX actually went after others in his court, including his sisters and even animals. Charles had a disfiguring birthmark between his nose and upper lip, giving him the nickname the Snotty King. And he was given to fits of rage and sadism, though he was a mama's boy to his regent, Catherine de Medici, who literally ran this country even once the king grew up. In 1561, at the age of 10, Charles took the throne after all eligible heirs had died, through no fault of his own. As he grew up, Charles became tall and physically strong, but his physical and mental problems increased with age, and as one suffered, so did the other. Charles was unbalanced to the point of insanity, and his anger was solved through violence or death that only Margot, his youngest sister, knew how to calm. If she wasn't around, someone would hand him a bow and arrow and say, hey, go hunt some deer nearby. However, things like hunting and field sports didn't satisfy his bloodlust, and that's exactly what it was, bloodlust. To quote Charles himself, he preferred to use the knife because he liked the blood and wanted to see it spurting out of animals. Shudder. So he fed this lust by dismembering domestic animals. He also liked lashing people until they bled, or going down to the blacksmith to beat out weapons for his armory until he was prostate with exhaustion. Then he'd go use them on more animals, or people. Number seven is Fyodor the Bell Ringer, who was the son of Ivan the Terrible and wasn't thrilled about ruling and left most of it up to his brother-in-law Boris Godunov. This would-be ruler is remembered for having next to no neck and spindle legs that made him shuffle in a stooped manner. That and his glazed vacant gaze paired with a permanent gillless smile that was variously ascribed to religious ecstasy or simple-mindedness, depending on the observer's point of view. Suffice it to say, even Ivan the Terrible knew his son was missing a few screws. So, anticipating his own death, Ivan tried to smooth the path for his humbly gifted son by creating a five-member advisory council to help him rule, which is how Boris ends up in charge. Because Fyodor didn't just not know how to rule, but he wasn't interested in doing so. In the 16th century Russia, feeble-mindedness was considered an especially inspired and childish form of wisdom, a foolishness in Christ. Apparently in the olden days, Russians characteristically looked at these persons with respect, if not reverence. This is why, unlike so many kingdoms on this list, Fyodor wasn't just tossed in a room and left to rot. Homeboy actually dies peacefully in his bed. Fyodor spent most of his time praying, visiting monasteries and churches throughout the realm, and of course, what he was named for, ringing the bells that called the faithful to mass. Number six is Maria of Portugal. She starts as Maria the Pious, the first undisputed queen regent of Portugal and the first monarch of Brazil, who spent the first 10 years of her reign as an eloquent and respected leader. Then 1786 rolls around and she needs to be carried back into her castle due to a random state of delirium that hits her. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the last. In 1786, Maria loses her husband slash uncle, her eldest son and heir, her only daughter, and then her confessor consecutively. Maria had already been in a fragile state, but their losses caused her to nosedive into religious delirium. Convinced she was going to hell for the sins of her father, claiming to see his black and charred corpse dragging itself along hallways of her home, or in her mind's eye, being tormented by demons. Visitors to her apartments would complain that they were tired of her constant screaming and wailing, which was only amplified by the bloodletting that was meant to cure it. According to some reports, she also became rather fond of wearing really tiny clothing. Number five is Charles the Mad. There's many crazy rulers named Charles. Maybe it should have been written off as a royal name at this point. But this Charles may have been mad because of schizophrenia, which nobody in his time would have understood or treated accurately. Honestly, much of the same can be said for multiple rulers on the list as their afflictions were caused by mental illnesses and not always by the fact their parents were also their aunt and uncle. Charles didn't really become crazy at any given point, rather grew into it. He believed he was made of glass, liable to shatter at any moment. To prevent himself from shattering, the king had iron rods sewn into his clothing, the world's first Iron Man. So suck it, Tony Stark. In 1392, Charles attempted to kill his own friend and then got confused as to what was happening while he did it. Coming to, he thought someone else had jumped his friend, so he took an army after the supposed perpetrator. Then he falls back into the same weird state he was in when he tried to kill his friend in the first place and cuts down four of his own men. The others have to drag their king from the horse to get him to stop, at which point he enters a catatonic state and has to be wheeled back to the castle in a car. They concluded that he was probably just under a lot of stress, as it was the first time Charles had really shown signs of not being totally right in the head. In the following years, Charles would go through episodes of forgetting people's names, including his own, and the fact he was king, when he wasn't running through his castle protecting 
pretending to be a wolf and howling at people. He was later removed from power for acting insane, but not dethroned, since Charles the Mad lived for some 30 years after his first fit of the crazies, while his brother started a civil war for his throne. Number 4 is the Zengdi Emperor. This Ming Dynasty ruler is one of their most notorious. Unfortunately, not for good reasons to end up on this list. Speaking of, if you're enjoying, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive to stay up to date because we have plenty more lists like this. The Zengdi Emperor was renowned for both his foolishness and his cruelty, despite making some major campaign and political decisions that benefited his country. When he wasn't, well, the Emperor played pretend. He built a whole fake city block on imperial grounds where he would pretend to be a shopkeeper to the puzzlement of his subjects who were forced to go along with it. Occasionally, he pretended he was an army general despite having no experience or expertise and went on raiding parties where he'd almost get captured. And he'd make the entirety of the army dress in all silk for some reason while doing this. Weirder still, this emperor invented an alter ego he named Zhu Shu, whom he would order on these said pointless raiding parties to the exasperation of his government who had to pretend they weren't just talking to their own emperor in a wig. Ming era novels such as the Zengdi Emperor roams through Jiangnam cast the emperor as a foolish and gullible man, at one point enjoying a bowl of rice gruel he believes to be made from cooked pearls. Number three is Maria Eleonora. Desperate to give her husband an heir, Maria of Sweden had a slew of pregnancy issues that drowned her in postpartum depression and anxiety, on top of the court pressure to even produce a girl at this point, just something as an heir. This was a lot for her mentally, so when she finally did succeed in producing a child, a girl named Christina, she completely lost it. The postpartum was too much for this queen who screamed that she hated the dark eyes and the hair of this girl and woed over not having a son and that God was punishing her. Meanwhile, the girl's father was wearing a big hat, cigar in hand, and grinning ear from ear. Christina had to be kept from her unstable mother who couldn't be trusted alone with the girl after some sketchy incidents occurred. That changed when her husband, King Gustavus Adolphus, who was happy to have a daughter, was battle less than two years later. Maria Eleonora responded with hysterical grieving. She shrieked in despair she was inconsolable, lamenting her cruel fate to be robbed of the light of her life while they were still both so young. That grief, however, included keeping her husband's body above ground for 18 months so she could periodically touch it, cuddle it, and kiss it, you name it. All the while, she made Christina sleep under a golden casket that contained her father's heart. But their relationship improved after that and miraculously Christina grew up to be a functioning woman and queen. Number two is Mustafa of Turkey. This is one where crazy kids can't be blamed on the dude himself or the parents being siblings, but rather the classic sultan tradition of locking the royal family away in cages to keep them from usurping the throne. Mustafa I was locked in said gilded cage for 10 years and was actually spared the usual fate of death by his elder brother Ahmed. After his brother died airless, Mustafa's released from his golden cage, but then he's sent back just a few months later when his brother's son took the throne instead. Apparently Mustafa was very neurotic from living in fear of sudden death while locked in a box for 14 years. When his nephew was in a coop just after four years, years later in 1622, Mustafa was once again dragged from the safety of his cage to have the crown plopped on his head. He was frequently found running through the palace, knocking on doors and screaming for his dead nephew to come back and rule Turkey again. Many doctors treated Mustafa, but his condition only worsened. He was often seen talking to imaginary people and fed coins to fish and birds. What completely convinced the viziers that something was off was when, during a court meeting, Mustafa yanked on their beards and tossed off their turbans as part of a fit. He was dethroned after three months of rule because he refused to bet a woman and concerns for an heir flourished. That, and he was nuts. Number one is George III, who made it 28 years before he was first hit with his mental illness in 1788, which we now believe to be a case of acute porphyria, anxiety, hallucinations, severe pain, nausea, vomiting, palpitations, high blood pressure, numbness, muscle weakness, brown or red urine, and blindness are some of these diseases' many symptoms, and they were once all found in this wacky king. I said it first hit in 1788, and it hit hard. The king was gibbering for hours on end and foaming at the mouth. Symptoms deemed serious enough for a bill to be drawn up in Parliament for his son, George I, to become regent. Before the bill could pass, George, the initial one, recovered from his senses and all was well with the king for the next 11 years. He had a small relapse in 1801 and 1804. Then in 1810, his mental illness came down hard and it never left again. This intelligent, polite family man had turned into a raving lunatic. A visitor to Windsor was astonished to watch the king bury a stake near the castle, believing it would grow into a beef tree. Another saw the king trying to shake hands with an oak tree, believing it to be the king of Prussia. His doctor, Francis Willis, believed the root cause of the mental illness was overexcitement and intended to cure the king by strictly controlling his behavior. If the king acted up, Willis ordered the servants gag him and place him in straitjacket and leave him to thrash around, making incomprehensible noises until he calmed himself down. When the king behaved himself, he was rewarded by being allowed to see members of his family. When he misbehaved, it was back into the straitjacket. Even mealtimes became a carrot and stick exercise. When George was bad, he ate mushed up food 
food from a wooden spoon. When he was good, he got to use cutlery. The final blow came in 1810. Already almost blind due to cataracts, the king suffered a final catastrophic mental breakdown that left him permanently gone. He would babble for hours, lost the ability to walk, and eventually succumb to dementia. Towards the end of his life, he was incapable of understanding anything, such as the death of his beloved wife, and lived as a long-haired, bushy-bearded recluse in Windsor Castle until his death from pneumonia in 1820. Shh, no spoilers. Anyways, disturbed family number 10 will be the Ditlows. This is actually far more recent than you may be expecting, hitting the news headlines in March of 2022. But the nightmare began six years before that, when a Polish woman was smuggled into the UK on a minibus under the promise of starting a new life in the country after losing both of her parents. The woman, unnamed but mentioned to be in her 40s, was given this invitation by Isabella Ditlow and her husband Andreas. She was under the impression she'd be a paid caregiver to Isabella so that her adult children Cezanne and Camille could go off to college. Police said the victim worked for the family on the outskirts of Birmingham and Enfield for more than five years, in conditions that amounted to modern forced labor. She would do grueling tasks for hours on end, seven days a week, unpaid, barely fed, forced to sleep in a shed without a bathroom or a shower to clean herself, let alone having a blanket. Police later stated she also was kept isolated, not allowed to use the phone or contact any family, and that her Polish identification card was kept from her which was the only documentation she had. They made the victim believe should she go to the police, she would never get help and would actually be in trouble. An investigation was eventually launched after concerned neighbors called the Modern Servitude Helpline. The victim needed extensive persuasion to even leave the property, denying she was being held against her will by family. Eventually, they managed to coerce her into a police vehicle for warmth and offered her a coffee. This kind gesture immediately broke her silence. The family of four was arrested on May 14th of 2020 and jailed on Friday just after they were found guilty following the seven week trial. Disturbed family number nine will be the Fry family demon. So in 2015, the Fry family from South Wales became famous in Britain news, as they say they had been left battered and bruised by an evil incubus demon haunting their home. While the family wasn't clear as to when it started, Tracy and Karen Fry said that it was getting worse and worse and there was nothing we can do, and that it's affected our marriage because we've been drowning and fighting all the time about the demon. It has been feeding off of the negative energy. The demon, believed to be an incubus, was apparently summoned when the Fry's offspring decided to make the classic mistake of effing around with an Ouija board. You'd think people would know by now. Karen is said to have taken this picture, which shows a little blue face ghost demon thing with a tail. Kind of looks like a well-placed doll to me, but hey, I wasn't there. I can't know. By the time their story hit the print, the Fry's had already paid over 100 pounds for a ghost expert to come in and investigate after the ghost allegedly told one of the Fry's that it was going to slit your parents throats. Ghost investigator Robert Amor, armed with a Bible, crucifix, and a lot of confidence, has since forbid the family from using the upstairs rooms due to the fact you can, quote, feel the evilness in the rooms. Apparently the family's own cats could have just told them that because they'd been allegedly avoiding those spaces since activity started. Disturbed family number eight is the White House Farms tragedy. So August 14th, 1985, the bodies of Neville and June Bamber are found with their adopted daughter Sheila and her family deceased in the Essex farmhouse. Tragically, the placement of the hand arm used and the entry wounds painted an image of a family member going rogue before taking their own life. At first, police believed this to be the case. Sheila had been immensely troubled in her life and was diagnosed with schizophrenia, so it was assumed she'd maybe gone off her medications. Weeks go by and the remaining family member, 24-year-old adopted son Jeremy Bamber, plays the role of a grieving man until his ex-girlfriend hits up the police with some concerning news. She believes Jeremy, who said he was miles away away from home when the deaths took place, had done it, and framed his adoptive sister. The police looked back over the evidence and realized because of the silencer's length that was found on the hand arm, Sheila actually wouldn't have been able to hold it and take her own life. The red flag is now raised, Jeremy's promptly arrested. It turns out it was all for inheritance money. Jeremy was not only after his adoptive parents' life insurance, but his sister's as well, and by eliminating her entire family unit as well as their own, Jeremy would be the sole beneficiary to a six figure fortune and multiple properties. He was arrested and charged for the five deaths in October of 1986. Disturbed family number seven is Scandalous Seymours. We talked about this messy family in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Repulsive Queens with Disturbing Reputations. If you end up enjoying this video,
video, I encourage you to check that one out next, and maybe while you're at it, subscribe to The Hive to keep up to date on our regularly posted content. Jane Seymour has the most recognizable name in the family, thanks to Henry VIII and the fact that she is the only one of his wives he ever truly loved. However, her dad and brother were complete nightmares. To give you an idea, Sir John Seymour was a soldier and courtier, and his son, Edward, was a raunchy little creep. When he's put into an arranged marriage with Catherine Filio, it changes nothing. The couple hates each other, and Edward takes off to go play toy soldier and, and bang some random biddies, while Catherine woes away in her lavish mansion and starts venting her problems to Sir John Seymour. Apparently dad was better at picking brides for himself than for his son, because the two start an unsubtle affair around 1520. Catherine's father removes her as the family heir in response, and Edward refuses to acknowledge Catherine's pregnancy or subsequent child as his own. She ends up rotting away in a convent in the end. As for Edward, well howdy doody, he remarried Catherine Parr of all people, Henry VIII's widow. But he's also famous for being super weird towards the young King Edward. Yes, everyone is named Edward. Edward or Catherine, welcome to my hell. And also, he was known for hitting on the young Elizabeth I a bunch. One night, he's caught trying to break into the King's Hampton apartment because he accidentally popped one of Edward's dogs. <laughs> Nobody is sure what he was trying to do, whether it was abduct, kill, or try to impress the juvenile king with a cool hand arm to win more brownie points, it doesn't matter because Edward Seymour is put to death the next day. Disturbed family member number six is the North Shield, aka a death cult, but one of those ones that upheld the whole oh, we're a family thing, so I'm counting it. They were led by a vengeful, violent, and brutal individual named Zahid Zaman, who pulled the trailer park boys move of pretending to need a wheelchair when he didn't, and was thought to be a harmless, disabled man in his council estate in Tynanware. He was a regular at charity events with local politicians, and even once refused a reward for returning a lost dog to its owner. But the reality was, he was a callous and uncaring man with a quick temper, berating and harming his group of girlfriends. Regardless, he managed to move all three women into his house and conduct adulterous relationships with two of them simultaneously, holding their attention with tales of rapture, the occult, God's glory, and your other usual culty mumbo jumbo. This is also how they meet Jimmy Prout, a father of two down on his luck after succumbing to substance addiction. Together, the three women and Zahid torment Jimmy with regular beatings for weeks on end. He even posted his bruised body on Facebook in a cry for help. The group chiseled out his teeth, forced him to have adult engagements with animals, and even went so far as to cut off one of his, uh, force him to eat it. In February of 2016, Jimmy is killed by Anne Corbett and Zahid as Myra Wood and Kay Rathwood stand back and watch. After his body was found, it was an easy paper trail back to the cult family who were all subsequently charged. Disturbed family number five is fairly well known to family. It's the Bean Clan. Legend or reality? Fact or fiction? We'll never know. But what we do know is endless movies and TV shows have been based on this iconic family, said to have lived in 16th century Scotland. Alexander Sawney Bean was a farm worker, and when escaping some blah 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 blah, he and his wife decided to hole up in a cave and just never leave it. It was also right after they got married. I call that a honeymoon. Look, honey, next to that stalagmite, we can put the chase. Oh, and next to that bear skeleton, we can put the crib. You can't make much money living in a rocky cave land, so Sawney took to watching out for passersby to rob. Wanting to avoid detection as well, he made the logical jump that instead of wearing a disguise while robbing people, he could just kill them instead. The next logic jump after that was, wow, look at all that available meat. Uh, so yeah, the beans took on a new diet after that, and so did their rapidly growing family. Having birthed 14 children, everyone grew up in the cave together, and then proceeded to produce 32 grandchildren without ever leaving the cave. The amassed bean clan was said to have killed half a dozen victims at one ambush alone. According to legend though, within 25 years, their victim count was somewhere in the thousands. Stories go that they met their end when word of the whack ass situation reached King James of Scotland, who sent soldiers and bloodhounds to go find and kill the group. To start family number four is Fred and Rose West, who were so fundamentally evil that their actions genuinely defy logic. Consider them like Britain's version of the Ken and Barbie killers of Canada, as the stories pretty much mirror one another. A couple that kills beautiful women only after the man has had his way with them, whose first victims are some of their own family members, and like the Ken and Barbie killers, a woman of the partnership is more psychotic and evil of the two, yet receives lighter consequences in public perspective. Between 1967 and 
1987, Fred and Rose killed 12 women, including their own elder daughters from previous relationships. Fred would dispose of the victims, who were often working girls, lured in by Rose, who would assume the role of one herself on Fred's request, by burying them under the garage of the house or in the garden, which he pretended was regular home improvement. In order to afford the supplies needed, Fred and Rose were also frequently stealing and fencing the loot. They are eventually caught when one of their surviving daughters breaks down to a friend about the physical violation she had been experiencing her whole life. Her friend, who inadvertently saves more than just her, tells the police. The West couple had already been questioned by the police multiple times by this point, again similar to Ken and Barbie, and then their backyard was dug up and dozens of bodies were found. Fred, like a little b-word, takes his life before seeing court, and Rose goes down on 10 charges and life in prison. Disturbed family number 3 is the Colt family. News spread like wildfire in May of 2012 when a 16 person Britain family was revealed to all share DNA. Naturally all families share DNA, but I'm talking more like really sharing DNA. All but one family member tested positive for homozygotsy, aka their parents were siblings or a parent and offspring combo. Four generations of these relations had gone virtually unnoticed until authorities investigated the clan living in filthy conditions in the isolated bush block of Australia. They had been sent to investigate, I kid you not, due to the fact that local farmers reported a smell of heavy urine and feces coming downwind. Turns out what they smelt were the open buckets that littered the sleeping area from miles away, and it's also a room that held 20 dogs. So Many of the family spoke unintelligibly, walked in a shuffling fashion, had never used toilet paper, a toothbrush, they couldn't read, they couldn't write, they had fungal infections and rotting teeth. The family patriarch Tim Colt fancied himself a traveling minstrel, the front man for his touring family's band. According to Daily Mail, Tim, who had moved the family between rural Victoria, Western Australia, and Southern Australia to evade detection of the creepy nonsense, had died by the time of the raid. Tim's wife June, herself the product of a sibling relation, had also died, but not before two of their own adult children had firmly established a relationship that would maintain the clan. Disturbed family number two is about the man who had the guts. Well, this is the view of the judge who sentenced Matthew Wales to 30 years jail for the slaying of his millionaire mother and his stepfather. The judge went on to say he had reacted not out of greed, but to what he believed were attempts to manipulate him and his sisters with money. Society killer Matthew Wales seemed to regard himself as a hero for this act, and a psychologist hired to gauge Matthew's mental well well-being after his arrest reported that Wales came to believe his mother had dominated him emotionally physically and financially all his life. The killings of her and Mr. King represented the ultimate expression of his independence. Matthew's own sisters and biological fathers after speaking to him had the impression that their family member thought the family had been done a favor by their mother's death. Matthew had invited his parents into his home for dinner when he laced their soup with powdered blood pressure and migraine tablets, saying he didn't want his mother to feel pain. However, when they left the house, Matt bashed their heads in with a chunk of wood and buried them in a bush. So. Oh, that's up in the air. He went on to tell worried siblings that perhaps their parents were victims of a carjacking or jumping or a jumping before being caught himself for doing it. Despite the feelings of the judge and the court psychologist, the remaining family said they felt the court had not uncovered the full facts of the case and the method of death. To us, his account was self-serving and based on selfish opportunity and selfish greed. We believe we have a right to the full facts. Disturbed family number one is the Philpot. So Tuesday, April. April 2nd of 2013 saw a couple sentenced for what the police have called an evil, stupid, and shameful act as part of a twisted attempt to frame a former lover. This is Mick and May Reed, who alongside a family friend, Paul Mosley, are all convicted of manslaughter for setting their own home ablaze and killing six people inside. The purpose of this, as mentioned, was literally revenge on Mick's ex-girlfriend, who escaped the triad relationship wherein she was a prisoner. Mick's plan was to heroically save his family from the fire he set, but that was something that quickly became an impossible feat. And despite this slight hiccup in plans, Mick continued to try and milk the situation. First, he forces May Reed to have adult relations with Paul to keep him silent. Then, Mick exploited public sympathy to raise money for the funerals of the lives lost. He demanded any money left over should be given to his family in Argos vouchers, and he demanded that hundreds of teddy bears that were left outside the burnt out house should be auctioned off and the money 
given to him. During press conferences, the tearful Mick acted more like an excited child than a grieving parent, reveling in the attention. This is what raises police suspicions, who dive into his record and find charges for an attempted killing and several violations. Two weeks after the fire, the couple and Paul are arrested. Inside a police bugged hotel room, they were caught checking their stories with one another before court, and it pretty much sealed the deal. As the jury delivered its verdicts in respect to Phil Pot, he stood in the dock, staring straight ahead with his hands clasped in front of him. He shook his head when the guilty verdicts were read out for him and his wife. She looked down at the floor and fought back tears while clutching a tissue in both hands. They're both monsters. Number 10, Genghis Khan's clan. We know Genghis Khan and his conquest to take over China was no small feat as it needed the help of his entire clan to help with his takeover. Coming from a small section in Mongolia, they formed together what had been the largest land empire in history. The Mongols always viewed family as the central pillar of society, and Genghis' sons and grandsons extended the empire from the western shores to the Black Sea to the Pacific. And although they seem outnumbered, their military tactics and psychological warfare were noted in constant success against their enemies. If the city and people they plundered surrendered, the Mongols would then treat them fairly and allow them to join in their bounty, but if the people resisted, they would feel the fury of the Khan clan. Despite the brutal acts of destruction, the Khan clan, whomever they inevitably conquered, the lands were actually safe and well controlled, and in many cases even improved from previous conditions. Subjects had personal liberty and had the rights to follow whatever religion they believed in without prejudice. Number 9. The Briley Brothers One of our sibling duos who had no problem committing crimes together starts with the Briley Brothers. In 1971, 16-year-old Linwood Briley shot and killed his 57-year-old neighbor, landing him in reform school. This violent episode was a taste of what was to come. From March to October 1979, Linwood and his brother James and Anthony embarked on a bloody hit spree in Richmond, Virginia, with accomplices Dunk. With accomplices Duncan Meckins, they robbed and killed at least 11 people. Two would-be victims would escape unharmed and they were able to report to authorities of the terrible crimes they saw commit. The brothers continued to leave a trail of terror throughout Richmond and after they were caught, Linwood and James were sentenced to death. In 1984, the two elder brothers escaped death row with four other inmates but were recaptured within three weeks. Linwood and James were executed by electric chair in 1984 and 1985 respectfully, and Anthony Brilly and Duncan Meekins are both still incarcerated. Number 8. Cray Twins In some parts of the world, having twins was considered a rare commodity, and in 1933, during a time where having children, let alone twins, was a prized rarity. Their mother, Violet Ann Lee Cray, was particularly given a slight celebrity status when her twin boys not only survived in their infancy, but also were able to survive in towards adulthood. Their mother, Violet Annie Lee Cray, was particularly given a slight celebrity status when her twin boys not only survived in infancy, but also were able to both be able to survive towards adulthood. Some might even speculate their mother planted seeds of malignant narcissism the twins would later display as adults. Born Ronnie and Reggie Cray were noted as one of the most dangerous twins in London. The twins formed an organized crime gang called The Firm, and these, ga and these gangsters were particularly active in London, England in the 60s. They were so dangerous due to their massive extortion rackets, armed robbery, arson protection rackets, gambling, and cold-blooded killings of rival gang members. That's when they were arrested on May 8, 1968. Ronnie ended up being filed as a certified insane person and was committed to a hospital. As for his brother Reggie was released from prison on compassionate grounds, both died five years apart from the other. Number 7. The Gonzalez Sisters The four Gonzalez sisters ran a successful business from 1945 until the police closed it down in 1964. So what was the business? Adult work. Rancho El Angela was a brothel in the Mexican state of Guanajuato and, and acted as the center of the sisters' large-scale adult work network. The women who worked for the sisters often did not so voluntarily. The Gonzalez sisters, well the Gonzalez family, had kidnapped some while others answered advertisements for housemaids. When the women arrived to the brothel, the sister would often force and inject illegal substances on those who, would re who were reluctant to provide the services that the sisters demanded. When the girls became unable to or reluctant to work and satisfy their clients, the sisters then killed them. If a client turned up with a lot of money, he too might end up dead and his cash stolen. When police raided the property, they founded the bodies of 80 women, 11 men, and various fetuses. Ugh. There were probably many more victims who remained undiscovered, and the Mexican court sentenced the sisters to 40 years in prison. Guinness World Records even named them the most prolific murder partnership ever. Number 6. The Harp Brothers Here's another pair of siblings for you. The Harp Brothers. Mecca Jai and Willie terrorized settlers in the remote, sparsely populated territory west of the Appalachian Mountains immediately after the American Revolution. The brothers had stayed loyal to the British Crown during the struggle and may have decided that they had better moved west after the American victory. They survived by robbing and killing the settlers who were beginning to cultivate the area and appeared to have thoroughly enjoyed the killing part. It wasn't long, of course, before the vigilantes started to bring the brothers to justice 
just as Mekajai died of his wounds and when a posse caught up with them in 1799, Willie escaped but the authorities captured and had him sent to the gallows in 1804. They were considered America's first serial killers of this time. Number five, the bloody benders. Running an Airbnb seems like a lot of work, especially when you're trying to make sure your guests and yourself are happy with the accommodations. You got your nice bed and breakfast, and oh, of course, a nice dinner where the host comes up from behind you and smash you in the head with a sledgehammer. Oh wait, no, that's not a good idea, actually. Uh, yeah. In 1870s, travelers headed west on the Great Osage Trail may find themselves in a cabin made by the Bender family in Labette County, Kansas. And eventually, they would find themselves dead and gone by the family's unexplainable reasons to commit crimes. To be honest, officials still don't know why the crimes were done the way they did. They actually suspected robbery, but most of these travelers weren't even wealthy. Maybe in some sadistic manner, the families just felt like it. But either way, before the locals got suspicious, this family disappeared around the same time another family called the Kellys, surprisingly, were new in town. Number four, the Borgias. Originally from Spain, this family became so important in the 15th century political and religious world. Ambition and hunger for yet more power, the family included two popes. Lucrezia is probably the best remembered member of the family as she was the daughter of Pope Alexander, and her family was perfectly happy to use her as a pawn in their power plays. She entered into several arranged marriages, each one helping the Borgias extend their grip. Kind of like in the movie Get Out by Jordan Peele where they use Rose to get their new vessels for whatever it was that they were doing. Hmm. Contemporaries often portrayed the extended family as ruthless, a family that would stop at nothing in pursuit of its own ends, and by the time the Alexander Papacy ended, people suspected them of adultery, theft, bribery, and breeding, and morally injuring people. Whether or not these situations were true, historians do suspect it might have been conspiracies made by jealous rivals. Number three, the Bean Clan. Spoiler alert, if you watch Attack on Titan, you might know the scene where Hanji had two titans in her custody named Swanee and Bean. Well, those names were actually based on a real family, the Bean family, and their head, Swanee. Although his name is actually Alexander Bean, him and his wife in the 16th century set up a nice little home and abode in a cave by the countryside of Scotland. In their little sea cavern, they produced up to 45 children who were also some a produce of inbreeding. And by that point, they figured they couldn't just hunt for omega-3s by the seas, they needed to resort by some other ways to provide excellent nutrients. So they began tricking, trapping, and kidnapping travelers and dipping them into homemade ranch dressing. That's right, they ate people. And they survived by eating people. The clan only operated at night, and when they returned home to their little caves is where they could eat the roasted man or woman. The locals didn't know this was a thing, and for 25 years, the clan survived and ate up to a thousand people. The family was tracked down by authorities and all died under their custody. The tale of the Bean clan only appeared in a Newgate calendar in the 18th century, and its publications always highlighted awful crimes to educate its readers. However, this was the same type of publication that had the same notoriety as a fake news forum. Number two, Fred and Rose West. Ever see someone at the bus stop and thought they were really cute, but also thought, hey, you know what? They'd be a great accomplice for a lot of crime. And that's what happened to Fred and Rose West. The two serial killers met at a bus stop and somehow created a relationship with one another. From 1971 to 1987, the couple would sought out female victims in Gloucestershire, England, and after tormenting and eventually slaying the victims, they would bury them in their cellar. Earning the name the House of Horrors among the many victims was actually Fred's daughter. By 1994, the law finally caught up with the couple and Rose was convicted up to 10 of the crimes and sentences to life in prison. Meanwhile, her cohort, Fred, took his own life before he could be convicted. When he did die, he did confess to 30 of the victims he tormented, which unfortunately might be even speculating that there's probably more victims left undiscovered. Number one, Sackler family. The Sackler family is an American family who owned the pharmaceutical company and have faced lawsuits regarding overprescriptions of addictive pharmaceutical drugs, including Oxycontin. Purdue Pharma has been criticized for its role in the opioid epidemic in the United States, and they have been described as the most evil family in America and the worst drug dealers in history. They were often cited as early pioneers of medication techniques, which, which ended the common practice of lobotomies, and were also regarded as the first to fight for racial integration of blood banks. In 1996, Burdu Pharma introduced Oxycontin, a reformulated version of Oxycodone, in a slow release form. Oxycodone was first invented in 1916 and sold as Eucodal, but had been withdrawn from the market in 1990 due to addiction issues. Hmm. Despite them putting out their good deeds through donations by multiple Ivy League schools and art foundations, they're also noted for their money laundering and, of course, the opioid lawsuits. 
According to the New Yorker, Purdue Pharma played a special role in the opioid crisis because the company was the first to set out in the 1990s to persuade the American medical establishment that strong opioids should be much more widely prescribed and that physicians' long-standing fears about the addictive nature of such drugs were overblown. Yeah, okay. Purdue Pharma was dissolved on September 1st, 2021. The Sacklers agreed to pay $4.5 billion over nine years with most of that money funding addiction treatment, as they should. 